really good song from the early 80s and um, also a good novel which I just bought yesterday in the old lady shop Françoise Sagan and uh, I haven't read any Françoise Sagan this is the first novel I've read about 50 pages of this so far it's the original edition in Julliard which uh, is um, 1956 it was her second novel the follow up to her big hit, um, Bonjour Tristesse, and, um, but it's also, what you were hearing there was a little snatch of uh, Matt Johnson's song, The The, I think it was 1982, uh, and it was on his album Soul Mining, and it has a famous um, kind of uh, piano solo by Jules Holland in the middle of it, but it's, it's a good song despite that. Um, apparently there was also a Johnny Mathis song called Certain Smile. And um, so Matt Johnson might have been riffing on Johnny Mathis, but also certainly on this, because people in the early 80s were reading this kind of thing. Paris was a kind of dream place for us. Those of us who are new romantics, so, you know, if you listen to Visage, Fade to Grey, it wants to be French. Quite a lot of the pop from that period, Mark Almond, Soft Cell, wants to be sleazy in French, a little bit romantic, a little bit... Um, adopt the sort of café society style of France at that time, of France perennially. Um, some of us lived the dream and went and lived in Paris. I did that for two years. Um, so reading this, I really got flashbacks to that time of my life, which was a happy time. I, I was on my honeymoon and then married, um, or married and then on my honeymoon, and uh, lived for two years in Paris. In the 18th arrondissement, first of all, the... Uh, the uh, Rue du Colancourt, which is right by La Marque Colancourt station, metro station. Then I moved up onto the top of the, the boot, uh, right by the Sacre Coeur Cathedral, in the Place du Tertre, Place du Tertre, which uh, is ridiculously touristic and um, in a way was the culmination of a ridiculously stereotypical Paris dream. Um, and it was, it was a good time, uh, um, sort of um, enchanted and, and unreal time in the same way that the Place du Tertre is somewhat unreal, in that I was working um, with Japanese singers who had their own dream of Paris. It's a very strong Asian thing. I've noticed this a lot if you stay in, um, for instance, when I was staying in Seoul, in my Airbnb place uh, beginning of this year, I noticed that the, curtain, the sort of decorations of the uh, little apartment were all referring to the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and uh, there's a certain Asian dream of Paris which exists to this day. I think it used to be seen as a Japanese thing, the Paris of our dreams. There's a whole chapter called the Paris of our dreams in Ian Baruma's book, um, uh, A Japanese Mirror. And of course, I've blogged before about how Parisians have... Uh, um, special hospitals for the Asian tourists, the Japanese tourists who come to Paris and find it actually not as dreamy as they would have hoped. They find it quite aggressive and threatening in some ways. Um, so there's a certain kind of Paris syndrome where people fall sick, Asians fall sick in Paris with disillusionment really. Um, but it is largely, it gives value for money still as a holiday destination and it's spread from Japan to the whole of Asia now, which, uh, you know, people in the Philippines, people in Korea, people in China are all still thinking of Paris as somehow the ideal city, the, the dream European city anyway. New York, to some extent, is also an ideal, um, certainly in the way people are wearing clothes, which are quite New Yorkish, um, in a gap sort of way, you know, sort of collegiate 
sweatshirts and jeans. And that's very, still very widespread in Asia. But Paris is the kind of dream destination. Possibly Venice as a secondary thing. Nobody really dreams of Berlin. Very few people, maybe the really arty ones. But um, the normal mainstream dream is Paris. Reading this, I'm struck very much by how normal and mainstream the vision it presents is. It's about a, a girl a young student. I mean, she was, you have to remember that Françoise Sagan published Bonjour Tristesse while she was still in her teens. She was something like 18. So I think she's 20, 20 or something when she writes this one, A Certain Smile. And um, she's um, describing the life of a Sorbonne student. I lived in Paris with my young wife who was also a Sorbonne student. So it's a world I know, uh, although we were not so quite so left bank as... Uh, Françoise, uh, who in this, the, the narrator in this is called, um, I think, Madeleine. Um, and she has a nice boyfriend, and she goes to the library every day and lectures and bars and uh, clubs. Uh, these sort of cellar clubs on the left bank. But um, one day he says, let's go and meet my uncle who's a traveller. And her, the uncle turns out to be rather attractive. Not necessarily good looking, but attractive enough for this um, narrator to fall for him. And then it's, um, so far anyway, it's just about their slow flirtation and the slow inevitability of the, the crumbling of her relationship with Bertrand, her, her boyfriend, as she moves towards Luc, who's the voyageur uncle. And it's, it's kind of normcore. It's very mainstream and, um, you know, sexy without being too racy. Um, I think at the time it must have been quite a shock for, for a young girl to be writing so naturally about normal sex, um, which shows you how fusty the novel must have been in the mid-50s. It's not as interesting to me as the uh, serious writers. I mean, Duras and people like that um, are kind of a little bit more serious or, or worldly or something, but it's precisely the reason... I mean, it sold two million copies, um, Bonjour Tristesse, and this one was also a big hit. And uh, Françoise Sagan, who you can see in these photographs, got very famous very quickly and got very rich very quickly and with the royalties for her first novel she bought a Jaguar she liked these decapotable sort of convertible sports cars and so in that picture back there you see her after her car crash very serious car crash in 1957 just the year after publishing this one she has this crash in an Aston Martin she's driving with like three friends and they, she can't take a curve on the road and they go into a field and the car somersaults two or three times and everyone gets thrown out relatively uninjured except Francoise at the wheel who gets trapped in there it, it takes half an hour to cut her out and um, after that she's in hospital for a long time and uh, she develops a dependency on opiates this becomes in a sense her downfall she gets druggy after that I mean, she's already kind of quite alcoholic, I think, and just addicted to the good life. I mean, she's very normal also in the sense that, like a pop star, she can't quite handle success. It comes very rapidly when she's very young. She thinks, I mean, there's almost a James Dean element to her as well. Although she's very normal, I think this is the nice thing about her face, is that she's not super beautiful. She's got a certain kind of face. Actually reminds me of my first French girlfriend, uh, in the 80s, uh, who was my second important lover, I guess, after the the dominant brusque one who sort of initiated me uh, in 1981. Um, there was then this sort of triangular situation, which it, in itself is worthy of a Françoise Sagan novel, where I, my best friend was a communist, and uh, he, he on, on the beaches of some Greek island, he found this girl dancing who's a French girl, and, and brought her back to Aberdeen. And so we all shacked up together. We lived in an apartment in Aberdeen just when I was founding the Happy Family. So I, I quit university and sort of left them to it. But he was very, he was very um, Marxist. Actually, rather in the way that I was describing the other day, um, we sort of male feminists, uh, fellow travellers with feminism, embraced some rather ridiculous positions as a result of people like Andrea Dworkin. So he decided somehow that sexual intercourse was invasive and counter-revolutionary. So his poor girlfriend was getting very frustrated and had to look elsewhere. And when we all moved to London in 
1984. First of all, we went on these holidays to the south of France. Uh, she came from Vence. And um, you can hear her voice on uh, Marcus, of, uh, on Blue Stocking, rather, my song Blue Stocking. She's the one reading Marguerite to Duras at the end. Sort of random fragments of, of Duras. Uh, she had this very sensual voice and generally a very sensual attitude to life. And she was a huge education for me sexually. Uh, I did lots of things with her, got, got um, involved other people and um, uh, all sorts of uh, kinky stuff that, that I hadn't really imagined up until then you could do. And then I ended up moving into her room uh, in Chelsea, so I lived for five years just off the King's Road in her, her room that she'd meanwhile moved up to North London. Um, but she introduced me also to a lot of French music, to Georges Brassens and Serge Gainsbourg and uh, Jacques Brel. So all this sort of Francophile pop that I was embracing in the 80s was uh, kind of her doing. But it was also because I'd been impregnated with these French values. My mother was an au pair girl in the 1950s, um, before I was born, just before she got married, with a family who lived on the Rue de Grenelle in the um, Saint-Germain-des-Prés area. Uh, Rue de Grenelle really right in the centre of the whole ferment that was taking place at that time and very much the hangout described and uh, the, the sort of place that uh, Françoise herself would have been hanging out. Françoise must have been in the first flush of her fame at that point. So I should sit down with my mother and talk about that, those, those days and what she thought of Françoise Sagan. Perhaps she thought she was a bit of a, a flippity gibbet. I don't know, she might have disapproved of her essential lightweightness. Um, there is a, a certain surety of touch. Um, quite, she's describing quite normal situations in this novel, but uh, with a certain subtlety. Uh, you know, it's, it's well written, it's very readable, it's a real page turner. You want to know what's going to happen in the relationships, and there's a kind of tragic inevitability about how it's all going to unfold, but um, it's an enjoyable read. And uh, so my mother impregnated me with these when she came back to Scotland. She was, my mother was from a very small town uh, called Blainfield. She'd also been living in Ayr at some point. Ayr and Blainfield, um, these are kind of provincial Scottish West Coast places. And to go to Paris at that age and have the experiences she had, she, she had already met my father and they were corresponding a lot and they actually came to Paris on their honeymoon when they got married in 57. But um, they... Uh, my mother did have a French admirer. I think she went to the cinema, sort of the films you would go to on the Champs Elysees or whatever. There's an amazing scene in this where um, the narrator goes to the Champs Elysees. She's still weighing up whether she should uh, cheat on her boyfriend, Bertrand, with Luc, this older man. And uh, she's sitting alone in the cinema, and this blonde, quite good looking guy next to her puts his hand on her knee. And um, she kind of lets him, and then they kiss and then she gets up and leaves the cinema and goes out. And she's not particularly perturbed by this experience. I'm trying to imagine myself doing that. I have never in my life put my hand on a stranger's knee in a cinema. I would consider it sort of a semi-criminal act, but that's because I'm puritanical and British and uh, formatted by all sorts of political correctness in my youth. I've been brought up not to do that. Nice boys don't. But... Um, you know, what the hell, it seems to have been totally normal in 1950s Paris. So um, this is the kind of liberation which I obviously needed. I needed a French girlfriend to sort of tell me that certain things were okay after all. But um, I'd already been getting this propaganda message about Paris. Paris, I have mixed feelings having lived in Paris. I'd, I, When I came back from um, Japan, from living in Tokyo in the early 20, 21st century, I had the choice of going to live in Paris or Berlin, at least that's how it seemed to me, uh, if I went back to Europe. Um, I thought I'd go back to Paris. Um, I'd left Paris in 97, my marriage had broken down. Why did my marriage in Paris break down? Largely because of the ambient, um, hunterly atmosphere in Paris. There was a sense of um, nobody respecting anybody else's partner girlfriend, boyfriend, even if you're married, you know, people just laugh in Paris if you're married. There was a sense that people are always hitting on my wife. And we had some celebrity friends who've gone on to even greater celebrity. One of them is uh, one of France's most famous actors now, sort of heartthrob male lead type actor. And he was interested in my wife, 
and could only be apparently dissuaded from seducing her by his best friend, who's also a sort of big TV personality and a philosopher <laughs> in, in France these days. Um, everybody has to be a philosopher, you know, in a sort of shirt-ripping way, sort of Bernard Henri Lévy kind of way to be a celebrity in France. You have to go on the book talk shows and talk about philosophy, um, which is usually, you know, philosophy of hedonism versus Islamic fundamentalism or whatever. Speaking of which, I mean, this is something um, alarming this year is that we have these um, two presidential elections, um, two stages of the same presidential election. And with Marine Le Pen um, currently... Actually, she's just been overtaken uh, for the poll lead by Macron, which is great, Macron, the independent centrist. But um, there's a great worry, of course, that the only thing that could propel Le Pen, the fascist, to the presidency of France right now is some sort of terrorist attack, which would presumably happen between the two electoral stages. Because she can't win, she can win the second, the first round, apparently, quite, e quite easily. It's quite a strong possibility. But to win the second round, there would have to be some kind of atrocity, some new terrorist act in Paris. So um, they have this operation called Vigipirate, uh, the Vigilant Pirate, where the police are all standing around with machine guns and they're expecting something and they're telling, telling everybody in Paris to be ready for anything. And uh, so I expect there's going to be extreme vigilant piracy by the authorities between the two votes because... Um, it's presumably in the interests of not only of the fascists, but of the fundamentalists who want there to be just overt conflict and you know, sort of ISIS logic of let's just screw everything up as, as much as we can. You can then um, take all the counter reprisals you want to the strong clampdowns on people's liberties. And I don't know. I really don't understand the logic of why it's better to make things worse, but uh, some people... The kind of people who plant bombs certainly do believe that. So I would be very um, anxious in Paris about precisely that eventuality over the next months. But um, there are also reasons why I didn't choose Paris as a place to go back to and chose Berlin in the end, which is part, partly this sort of sexual aggression that's omnipresent there, but also the fact people are generally unhappy. If you look at surveys of happiness in France, the French are always fairly miserable and Paris has a kind of aggressive ambience, whether it's the aggression of waiters and cafes. I don't like the Paris cafe, the model of the cafe that you get in Paris, where there's a kind of a certain machismo. You need, to, you need to be assertive and get the attention of the waiter several times and throughout the course of a transaction. Um, there's a certain contempt and snobbishness on the part of the waiters. And I don't know, it's just uh, just a certain ambience which doesn't really appeal to me. And, and also, the, um, there is a, a certain... You need to be quite street smart. And uh, so I guess the, the Asians who are going to these special hospital wings for, for getting over their disappointment, often they've been robbed on the street or they've had some sort of unpleasant encounter. They're certainly not used to the fact that uh, there's a, the opposite of the Asian... Um, kindness and friendliness uh, in shops and you know the general services the French are not made to, to really operate services despite the fact that they have this enormous tourist industry so there is a there is a stress and tension in Paris at the same time it's a fantastic place to visit and uh, I do like to go there each year um, partly because I snap back into my kind of French mentality and French personality because you it reformats your personality and you do become more, you know, kissy, obviously, you're kissing everybody and flirting a little bit more in the kind of socialised sort of flirtation which happens in, in France, um, in which it's almost rude not to flirt with the hostess at a dinner party, for instance. So, um, and, uh, yeah, so, so there are these various things that reading a French novel takes me back to. I, I, I'm particularly particularly drawn to this sort of almost a pre-birth memory of my mother's stay in the 50s in Paris. Uh, in some sense, it seems like more real before, before I darkened the doors, before I arrived on Earth. Somehow Paris was the real Paris. And if I look at old films of the old French cars with their sort of ridiculous 
bouncy suspension and uh, their greys and blues and uh, the fashions of Paris. It does seem to have been sort of itself in the 50s in a certain way, but so does Britain. I mean, everywhere was itself in the 50s in some way, you know, for better and for worse. Um, Britain must have been even more stifling. Um, but Paris was, at that point, still really much, very much the centre of the cultural world, and so um, it's exciting for that reason. So, even just looking at the, um, the catalogue list of the publisher here, the publisher, um, Julia, first of all, it looks a bit, doesn't it look a bit like Malcolm Garrett's design for magazines, the correct use of soap, just the, the way the, the devices and the typography works here. And, um, but also the fact that they've got, I don't know, mostly unknown authors. Um, Daniel Anselm, Georges Bortonov, uh, Pierre Boulle, who has a novel called E equals MC squared, which I don't know anything about. I looked up one of these authors, which is, the, you know, there's one with an African name, Ferdinand Oyono, and he has two novels in this series. One is called uh, Un Vie de Boy, which is translated in English as House Boy. And the second is called uh, Le Vieux Negre et la Médaille, The Old Negro and the Medal. And he's from Cameroon, an author. I mean, he's, he died in, I think, 2010, relatively recently. He was a diplomat for most of his life and was actually running UNESCO. He studied in Paris and went back to Cameroon, wrote these novels, and, and was rose right to the top of the political life of, uh, of his country. Became uh, not quite president, but he was like the the assistant to the president or something. And, um, yeah, sort of interesting. Um, there is an, an alternative world map you get from France. The perspective of the world is that Africa looms very large. Africa is right there, and this is why when the Cubists and people were, were making their revolutionary artistic breakthroughs, it was a combination, it was a splicing of French culture with African culture and um, the masks and, and, and Spanish culture, obviously, as well the masks and the kind of faux primitivism uh, which uh, Picasso particularly was interested in. And you still feel that to, the, to this day when you go to um, uh, Chateau Rouge station or uh, some of these um, Belleville uh, areas uh, in France. It's very, there's a very African sense. You see Af African fabrics, African people, um, post-colonial. And of course, North Africa, very strong and bitter um, colonial struggles through the 60s in, in Algeria. Um, all of that is sort of um, marked in the DNA of French culture and um, part of its, its vivacity, but also its ongoing tragedy. I think it's in some ways a sad culture. I think of it as a sad culture and um, a slightly tense one. And I think this year that tension will, will break through. I hope not. I hope I'm wrong. Um, and, and I do think Macron, if nothing really awful happens, Macron is destined to be the next president, which is kind of good news at least for Europe and for the European project. Anyway, yes, Paris, thinking about it, reading about it, living as an Asian living in a kind of imaginary dream Paris myself and um, in the 1950s. Open University.